Well, welcome back to the Fearless Future podcast. We're your host, Glenn. And I'm Amber. And today we're going to dive into why we invest in upstate New York. Common question we get is, why in the world do you guys invest in upstate New York? Why do we invest in upstate New York? Well, <laughs> because one of us was born there. True. That's why. And then the other one of us fell in love with a damn Yankee and had to move there. I like how you swear right in the first eight <laughs> seconds of the podcast today. We're off to a walk and start. Here we go. Walk and start. Buckle here we, up. Here we go. So I think it's important that we talk about it because we're we're about to have a our first ever, uh, not first ever, but our first live home flipping workshop there. In the four years. Yeah, in four years on April 12th through the 14th. Yeah, um, kind of exciting. In, yeah, Schenectady at the uh, at the Double Tree, And so that's three days of, as you know, we've, we've helped a lot of people get started we with have. that. And a lot of people in the capital region. I think that people will love to hear from us because we flip 100 houses a year in the capital region. Now we've done... As of today, I think it's 1,154, so, so 1,154 flips. Hard to believe. <laughs> it, it is, it is. And, and they've, they've all, except for a couple, been in the capital region. Yeah. That's really where they've been. So when people say, well, why do you do it? Well, we have a system that works. Right. You know, it's, it's, you know, is it perfect? No. Is it easy doing work in New York? No. No. And there's a reason for that. You know, it's a lawyer state, which I want to dive into today, why it's a lawyer state, not a title state. Um, that makes it a lot more challenging. So, but I think we should talk about that. I think we should first talk, talk about just what you said. Like we started investing there. We, we didn't have any grand vision when we started. We flipped our first house no, in what? We started with one. We, we bought it in 2007. We bought our first rental together in earlier 2003. 2003. Yeah. So that's 20, that's 21 years ago. Yeah. Holy Hard crap. to believe that too. Yeah. That sucker. You got old, babe. That sucker. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so we probably should dive in and talk about why it's important to invest where you live because when we first got started you know we didn't have any grand vision did we no we we were in a desperate situation we just needed to make some money fast and right. we said you know we, we kind of dove in without knowing anything yeah and all i know is that there's houses around me so wherever you are there's if there's houses around me and people are buying houses well i'm sure i could flip one sure. so it just kind of made sense yeah but i think that we should talk about why it's important to be local because i think when you first start if you're going to flip houses when you start it, it, by the way, if you're going to just buy rentals and, that's, and you have cash and credit and you just want to buy rentals, you can buy turnkey rentals in better states than New York. Sure. No question about yes. it. You can go to a lot Tennessee, more landlord friendly states. Tennessee and uh, Florida. The sunshine state. Yep. You can go to Texas. Yep. Right. Those are great places that are a lot more landlord friendly if you're just going to buy rentals, which right. I believe is a good investment. We have about 50 rentals in upstate New York because, again, that's where our model is. That's where we're that's where we now. We, that's a different discussion for to keep buying more rentals up there. But. Let's talk about why it's good to get started where you are. You know, if you're flipping houses, like you said, rentals are a different story. But if you're flipping houses, it's better to have eyes on and, and hands on and ears mm -hmm. on and be able to go to the job site and see what's being done. Can you flip long distance? Sure, it can be done, but it's a lot more challenging. There's a lot more risk because I think contractors can end up screwing you a lot more. No, they you, would never do you, that. You aren't able to go and physically see what's happening at the project. And also not only that part of it, not only the flipping part of it, but just when you live somewhere, you have knowledge of that area. You right. know what the good school districts are. You know what the bad areas are, the neighborhoods, the hoods, the, you know, you, you have that information and that knowledge at your fingertips because you live there. Yeah, you think about areas where we live, where we lived in Rotterdam, there's areas in the town of Rotterdam where literally you cross a street. One street. And the property values drop by twenty twenty thousand dollars at least. Right, it's yeah. it's kind of crazy. We have we have a lot of houses there, even rentals now that right across Crane uh, Street. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So right, right, well, right across right across Curry Road, you know, over in the Colonial Manor. Yes, Colonial Manor, and you have, you have higher value prices. Literally a half mile away across Curry Road, your property values drop to fifty thousand less dramatically. And so, if you don't live there, though, you don't know that. Right. You wouldn't have any idea. You, right. you can look up comps, but you can be very confused because your comps will show you within a half mile radius. Right. And yet you don't know. So I think being being local is really important. Mm -hmm. Another reason you mentioned, too, is that you know the area, but you also have connections. Right. Now, even though when we first got started, I didn't really have connections in construction per se. I had a best friend at the time that knew but construction. You know people that know people and you can ask for referrals I and did. references. And I go to my dad's house and borrow his saw. Remember? I do. I remember borrowing his tools because I we, we did a lot of the work ourselves in that first flip. So we had all that. So you when you're local, you have a lot of connections that really make it make it worth a while. So I think that's really important. So, you know, being able to, to have boots on the ground. Yeah. Um, and go to the job site and, and the local information. I think those are probably the two biggest things. Yeah. 
I think so. When you, and when, once you get better and have a system, you can, you know, people might say, wait a minute, I thought you guys live in Florida. We do. We live in Florida and still do 100 deals a year in upstate New York, in the capital region of New York. But we have a system that runs up there. We have a leader that runs that company. Right. And so we're not involved every day, but we have a great leader and a great system. But that doesn't happen on your first flip. Right. And this is a different podcast, but we have a lot of private lenders that funded our deals. And a lot of them started out as our local connections. Our Correct. very first one was local. That's and very true. also having that local connection was what made all of the other dreams yes. come true. Yes, very true. Yeah. Yeah. And you, that was someone that Janie was someone that you worked out with. Right. At the you gym. Worked, you worked out with the gym and yeah. That, yeah, you have a local connection. And when we, when we said, Hey, you want to lend money to us? And that's a different podcast. Go look it up, but pretty cool. All right. So let's talk about why New York. Now we didn't know this until we first got started. So our first deal went, our first deal, then our second deal, then we had to start looking for private lenders. Right. And I started to realize why the capital region was such a protected bubble after about our second year. So we, as you know, we flipped our first house and then our uh, third house was 2008, right at the end when all of a sudden all the banking died and they removed all lending yep. from around the country. And I remember saying, we're going to have to get a private lender. Yeah, you called up your buddy at the at the mortgage company. I called my buddy Dave. If he's listening. I called up Dave and said, hey, you got to get me money. He said, bro, I can't get you any money. The, the banks are shut down. You You're can't. like, dude, it's me. I know. And he wouldn't, he couldn't give me the money. So, which is all good. I understood that. But then we had to go to private lenders. But then when I went to private lenders, I realized I had to, you know, the after we had our first private lender who was from the area, she knew yes. us. The other, the next big private lender was a guy named Bruce that I had who was in Massachusetts. And he didn't necessarily know our area. And when, they, when an investor says, well, why is your area a good area to invest? I thought, well, I don't know, because I live here. I mean, I didn't really have an answer until I started to research it. And what I discovered was what I want to talk to everybody about today. But even with him, it was still the Northeast. And he drove to Albany and we Correct. did a tour of the houses and we showed Correct. him around. And a lot Correct. of our private lenders were like that. So even though they weren't in Albany, they were still within driving distance. True. So that, that we could still that's show very them true. around. That's so very it, true. it was kind of local-ish. Yeah. So the reason I think it's such a unique place to invest, one of the big reasons is the economy never took a hit. It didn't. We didn't realize that until about 2009, 2010, when we saw people all over the country like Phoenix and Miami and Las Vegas, Las and Vegas. Florida. Yeah. Florida. You're, you had a friend, I think, in Phoenix that was, remember, he was buying land. Yeah. Remember that he was buying. Uh, it was Washington State. Yeah. Washington State. Yeah. He, was, he was buying spec land. Yep. And selling it, but like he'd buy it and six months later, he'd make 30000 just from appreciation. It was, it was insane. Right. Yeah. But he also, I don't know what happened to him at the end. Did he lose it at the end or no? No, I, I think he, he ended okay. up okay. Yeah. But a lot of people lost it right. there because they were, they were basing their, they weren't basing their investment decisions on fundamentals. They were basing it on this speculative huge spike. And, what, and people said, does that happen in, in Albany in the capital region? And I said, no. No. It's almost a boring place to invest. Because it's such a steady economy, we didn't have huge spikes. But if you don't have huge spikes, you also don't have huge dives down. Right, right. That was the big thing that, that investors got intrigued about is, so you didn't lose value during 2008. We're like, no. And I, I think that's most of America. You know, there, there well, are the big cities where that happens. And those yeah. are the cities you, you know, steer clear of. Very true. But most of America is pretty steady. I agree. I can speak, we can speak very... Um, I was going to say educatedly, but that's not the right word. So I, I doesn't, it's funny that I use that word incorrectly. Yeah. So that wouldn't be good. That so doesn't sound very I can educated. speak from an educated perspective. <laughs> yeah, I guess, whatever, um, about the capital region and because we've been there. And yeah. so one of the big things that I realized is that the reason the economy is so steady, there's about 51,000 state workers yep. that work in the capital because district. Because Albany is capital. Yes, it has its own. I mean, there, there are so many office buildings, not just the main office building, which, which is enormous in downtown or in Albany. Right. But it's also where the governor is and yeah. all that, all the political crap and all that. That's all there. And there's a tremendous amount of hospitals and a tremendous amount of schools. And, you know, every city is going to have hospitals and schools pretty yeah. much. But it just seems like there's an excess of them. I don't know if it's because of the demographic or the age group or, or whatever. I but, don't know. But the capital region just seems to have a lot of hospitals. You know, there's Albany Med, which is where we ended up when our yeah. youngest son well, was let, born. Let's, and, let's, let's talk about that because we, we jumped off the, we jumped off the um, capital, capital, the, the, the state, state employees. Yeah. And the state employees, if you think about why that's so steady during the recession of 2008, there were no layoffs for New York state. Right. Right. The, the state, obviously, they charge an enormous amount in taxes in New York state. We all know that next to California, they're the second highest, if not the highest in certain areas in the country. 
they have an abundance, although they always have a shortage because they overspend. That's a whole different conversation. But they have a lot of money that comes in from all the taxes that we pay. So they don't have to lay people off. Right. Like, like, a, like a business has to lay people off when the economy is bad. The state never has to worry about the economy, especially in New York State, because they get so much money from, the from, city. from New York City. And so New York, what people don't understand is that New York City is two and a, or I'm sorry, yeah, New York City is two and a half hours south yep. of the capital region. I will say this, if you don't know anything about the capital region, everybody who says, oh, you're from New York, the first thing, if I don't say upstate New York, the very first thing, oh, New York City, and those who say, oh, I hear that's pretty wild there, or wow, the crime's bad there right now, or wow, how do you live there, or wow, I hear that's busy, I'm like, no, 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 you got the wrong thing. I had cows in my backyard growing yeah. up. I no, grew up in Dwayne's. It's true. Like I grew up in Texas, though. And even if you said upstate New York, I still wouldn't know what that was right. until I lived there. Right. So I think it's important people know that that's it's a very different area. So we're two and a half hours south of that. So so the economy never took that big dip. I want to go back to that. The economy never took the big dip because there's so many solid th that employer. The next important, like you said, is the medical. Yes. There's a lot of huge. Huge hospitals. And they're not and they're and they're. Um, they're like, what do they call them? Educating hospitals. So Albany Med is also teaching a te yeah. teaching hospital, right? Teaching hospital, you know, because when you were in the hospital with crews, they I were- I do. They, they were, were in my room every day. <laughs> yes, I know. They were, the young boys got to see a lot on you. So interesting. So nice. anyway, so, well, it is what it is, right? So, um, but Albany Med, if you look at Albany Med, like down in New Scotland Ave. It was like a city within a city in there. I remember is. getting transferred there when my water broke at 22 weeks with crews and I, I was lost walking around in there. That place is huge. Well, you haven't been there since. So about a year ago, I was down in Albany Med. I stopped to see a friend there. I forgot who I went to see, but I went to see a friend there. Oh, I know who it was. Um, uh, Becky and Pat's son, uh, oh, Shawnee. Shawnee. And he was in the hospital and I, I went down to see him and I looked up and I couldn't believe how much they've taken over more of the block. Oh, so really? th there used to be those buildings that were like going towards the park. Those are all now Albany Med buildings. Oh, They've wow. torn it down. It's all more Albany Med buildings. And I was, I walked in and said, well, you guys are like just taking over downtown Albany. I was overwhelmed with it eight years well, ago. And it, it's, it's gotten even bigger. So again, another steady employer yeah. that really doesn't lose, you know, people still get sick and there's still insurance money coming in. That, that, so that doesn't really get hit by the economy. So that Albany Med was big. Ellis Hospital was yeah. big. Now Ellis, I think, has taken over a lot of other hospitals. I think so. The management company has taken over. St. Peter's, another big hospital, yeah. another big employer you know, nurses, medical, medical staff and all that. So there's a lot of that going on in upstate New York too. And so just a really solid, um, and the colleges, my goodness, think about the universities. The colleges. Our daughter goes to SUNY Albany, which right. is, you know, I don't know how many tens, she said it's enormous. She's just tens yeah. of thousands of students to go there. You've got, you know, college is St. Rose. One of those colleges just closed. I forgot it which did. one it, it was. It wasn't St. Rose. It was one of them though. But, but there's like Albany Law School, Albany Medical College, Bryant Stratton, College of St. Rose. Union Columbia College. Green, Union College. You know, Union yep. College. Where uh, couple, the co community college. Yep. A couple of presidents went to Union College. I know, yeah. Car I'm pretty sure Carter went there and then some older president went there many, many years ago. So pretty wild. Um, but anyways, again. Hudson Valley. Uh, yep. Yeah, Hudson Valley. That's another, yeah, good part-time college. I mean, say part-time, it's a, it's a smaller school, but there's a lot of that. So I think that people don't realize that 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 these things we're talking about is what keeps the economy solid and keeps it together. Right. Especially when there's bad economies, because those people don't get laid off. So so people's right. jobs, they have job security. Yeah. And even in great economies, it's it's good, but it doesn't spike out of control. Even the real right. estate values didn't spike out of control. Right. So we didn't have to have the mass layoffs and all that. So that's an important part. I don't think I knew that. Like I know it now, like when we first got started, we didn't know that. But now I realize that that that's a key to why we're always steady. Our houses are always selling. We've never had a problem. We've had sometimes like right after in 2008, 2009, 2010, it was taking maybe 20 to 30 days to sell a house. Remember that? There was a period of time. Yeah, for, for a minute. It for seems like our houses have always sold within the first couple of weeks, usually. Always. I mean, by, by and large. We had a minute there where, yeah. where, you know, people were nervous about buying houses and all that because of what the nationwide news was saying. Right. But the local news doesn't know how to report on what's happening locally in the real estate world. Yeah. They just, they just take the national news and go, well, real estate prices are up or down today. Yeah. Well, but overall, they always go up. So never had it's, a problem with it's it. It's true. And I think that... Um, it's also a unique area because of the age of the houses. Like most of the houses in that right. area were built. I mean, and there are some really, really old houses too. There's some that are over a hundred years old. That one down the hill from us still we've, had the horse and carriage. Like we've worked on them and we've owned them. We, we own some we now have. over a hundred years old. Yeah, we do. Um, but by and large, those houses were built after World War II. And just because of the materials that were available, the type of wood, they had what I call good bones. Yeah. 
They they were structurally sound. They just needed a lot of cosmetic improvements. New yeah. kitchens, new baths, paint, maybe siding, that sort I, of I thing. I never really understood why back then, back in the day of the 40s and 50s when they built those houses, why people didn't have any closet space. And no, it's amazing how much crap we have now. Because they didn't have any clothes. The, the closet <laughs> space, the closet is no, I don't even, it's, it's smaller than a broom closet yeah, now. They're small. And, and the bedrooms were small. Right. And the bathrooms were usually small and they're usually one bathroom per house. Right. So that gives a lot of opportunity for a flipper to say, I want to add a bathroom. I want to make this bedroom bigger or I want to add on to a value add and add on. So it gives you a lot of options for our bread and butter. When we first got started, we did this to tons of houses. We would buy the two bedroom, one bath houses and they almost always had a walk up attic. And so we would that's already under roof space and it already had a floor and everything, but we had to finish it. So we would turn that into a master suite. With his and her closets, yep. <laughs> nice and big yeah. ones, and people just ate that up. We like, had to we had to have a seven foot six uh, clearance clearance on the top ceiling, so right. that was it was it was small, but it, as long as you weren't a giant, it worked right. really well for a lot of people. And it was funny because it was like the seven seven six was in the middle, it was right in the center. That was in the peak, and then it went like it went down on the sides, you right. know. But but nonetheless, but people love those. Well, we used to put a beautiful little bathroom up there, and that yeah. was a, that was a big seller. So again, the the type of house that's there makes a difference. Because I think if you're in a neighborhood that was only 30 years old, you know, if you're in an area where houses were built 30 years ago, it's tough to flip those. Like they, they're kind of already, they might need, at 30 years, they might need cosmetic work, but they weren't in such a way where you can make them, because the value add makes them so much more valuable. They weren't built like Ford Tough though. Like, like they, no the houses in New York, I mean, there's always the anomalies. There's always some houses that are going to have foundation issues or near a sinkhole or, or something like that. But for the most part, those houses were built really, really well. Well, you also used to love all the architectural the, stuff. The character, the character of the house, it was, yeah. was great. You know, a lot of them had the arched openings and doorways. And um, another thing that I always loved is you'd peel up the carpet that people started putting down hardwood in the floors. 70s and 80s. And there'd be hard, these beautiful hardwood floors yes. underneath. Almost every single house we did yes. had hardwood floors. I, and we would refinish them and they would just look I did love amazing. when the, we, we would get done. We always had that saying. People say, well, like, I see kind of a, a crack in the floor there. And you're like. That's character. That's character. And they, they, they had a hard time arguing with that. They <laughs> yeah. go, well, that's true. I mean, the floor is 60 years old. Yeah, because so we weren't building there. new houses. Right. So people didn't, it, uh, that's another thing, is because of the age of the houses, when people would come in and buy them, your potential buyers, they weren't expecting perfection. They knew it was a remodeled home. So if yeah. there was a little stain on the hardwood floors or there was some other issue with the house that was that was minor, you'd chalk it up to character. Yeah, if a door wasn't lined up correctly, it would, it would open and close, but the, if we kept the original doorknobs, yeah, the it wouldn't be knobs. exactly right. Yeah, we keep that kind of stuff. So a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, so definitely. All, uh, all good. I think, but, th- but those make for a good area to invest in because of the type of work that you have to do to the house. Right. And certainly they won't last forever, but, no. they're, but right now there's still a lot that are there. You just drive through any small town up there, whether it be, you know, our office is in Rotterdam, but Rotterdam... You go through Schenectady, you go through East Greenbush, you go through Albany, you go through Colony. Colony, Gilderland. You, Gilderland. You yep. go through Clifton, any, Park. Clifton Park, any of those little areas, you'll find so many of those houses you can just Saratoga. make. Yeah. You can just make them look beautiful. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of work there, a lot of uh, opportunity there. Price point's a big one too. That one was huge. It still is. It, absolutely. Yeah. Because we could pick up houses. I mean, we've talked about this on other podcasts. I mean, we've bought a couple of houses for a dollar before. That's a different people, conversation. People yeah, to get a, out of them. Those, but, are, th- those were not beauties, by the way. No, but, that was but Hamilton we've, got, Hill. we've gotten houses for twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. Yes, yes. And and that was not uncommon. Yeah. Fifteen years ago, to yep. be able to pick up houses that much, I think the prices increase yep. some now. Yeah. But still, your your barrier to entry was really really low. Yeah. And so, still, so today, I think our team still pays anywhere from eighty to one hundred and fifty, right. sometimes two hundred thousand, depends on what the ARV, which is after repair value, what it's going to sell for. Right. But as long as the numbers there, it works. But the 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 thing we always focus on, and a lot of us still do, is that we want to target first time home buyers right. for that finished product. That was huge. And so right now, a finished home, you know, you can buy a brand new home from us for about $250,000, $230,000, $300,000. It's in that range. Now, that sounds like a lot for first-time home buyers from old guys like us. From 15, 20 years ago, but now it's but not. Now it's not. That's the that's, that's the average going price. What they expect. There. Right. Right. Of course, right. they make 25 bucks an hour working at McDonald's, so they can afford it, I guess. But it's it's crazy. But. Well, and our sweet spot not only was dealing with first-time home buyers, but also we we had a way of making the houses feel a lot more expensive than we could sell them for. By yeah, adding, talk about that. That's interesting. Yeah, we, we would add some things that... Um, would you you wouldn't get in a cookie cutter house, you know, even if you're buying new construction, a lot of them are very cookie cutter, very builder grade. 
And so we would do some things in our houses to make it feel a lot more custom, like tiling the kitchen backsplash instead of just leaving it painted yeah. or tiling the the bathroom showers or or the tub area. Those things made a big difference and made the house feel really custom or, you know, taking out the wall in between the kitchen and the living room or the kitchen and the dining room and get, making it more open concept because those houses were yeah. rather small. So creating that open concept feeling was really, really big. And that, yeah. that helped a lot of the floor plans a lot. So you always try to make a, I always call it a master suite, but they don't call it, they call it an ensuite now, master right? With an ensuite, Monster yeah. with an ensuite. They, they changed the terminology on me, like everything. <laughs> but, but that was a big thing that it you, was, would, yeah. you know, when you walk into a first time home buyer house, you're like, I can have my own bathroom. This this beautiful with all this tile work yeah. and it's so nice, right? That you're it right. It made the house feel very custom instead of cookie cutter. So we could we could we would have you know the ARV at the time we were doing them back then was when we started was one fifty to two hundred. Yeah, and so but the houses felt like two fifty to three hundred. Right, because of those little touches that that we did that didn't break the bank. Right. We could afford to put that into the house. They weren't budget busters. Yeah but we were able to sell did the you houses mention, for a lot did more. Did you mention custom countertop? I don't know if you said that or not. Oh yeah, we always did custom countertop. Yeah. And you know, on the higher end houses, we would do um, a hard surface. So okay. we would do like granite. But again, that we gave them that the extra thing, but you could do that because of the house, right. because of the house. And then you can make it, you can and, make it better. And because first we were able bar. to purchase them for less expensive too. Yeah. I think too, there's, when you're trying, you know, as a flipper, you're trying to buy houses mm -hmm. and there's competition, no doubt about it. You know, there's, everybody says that we're the gorilla up there and I get it. You know, we do a hundred houses a year. So we, they all still get your own bars. They buy everything. Well, we don't buy everything because a lot of people are still flipping. We have students that are still flipping, right? Like, so oh, there, yeah. there's plenty to go around up there, but we do a lot. We're the, we're the biggest by a long shot up there. Well, think about it too, because of how many houses are up there and the era that they were built. A lot of people are aging out of those houses. So people are inheriting them or they're right. moving out or they're needing to, you know, downsize or. It's an older population right. up there for sure. Now, I think what, what keeps it good is that there's a lot of employers, including New York State. So people people come to SUNY and they wind up staying. Mm -hmm. You know, they go to they SUNY. Start families they start families. They graduate and colleges. And it's why I was it's why I was in New York till we moved to Florida. Yeah. I mean, that's where we were. That's my family was there. And you get stuck there. Hated the weather. But as you guys yeah. who are listening from the Northeast, you're probably going, yeah, I hate the weather here. I mean, I, every now and again, someone says, I love it. Well, good for you. Stay. Although I'm really you hoping know. that when we're back for the home flipping workshop in April, I'm really hoping the weather is a little nice. nicer. Yeah, we it's hope spring so. time. But I think that there's an aging population up there that are aging out of their homes. They're moving to facilities. They're the, the baby boomers. Yeah. So they're moving out. There's a lot of them. You know how you know that? Like in Rotterdam, I don't know. If, so I, I went home last week. I say home, went back to my former home where I grew up last week. And our office is on Altamont Avenue. They tore down a house on one side of us, two buildings down, and then four house, four buildings down, they tore down a whole corner. You know what they put up? Two more banks. <laughs> I've never seen so many banks and one street and drugstores. Banks, banks and, and drug pharmacies. <laughs> banks and pharmacies will tell you the demographic of the area. I remember going to the post office one time and I was like the only person in yeah. there under like 75. Yeah, yeah. The only one didn't have blue hair, right? <laughs> so yeah, I know. So anyways, my point is though that there's a lot of younger generation that are coming out of that right. that want to that want to have houses there. And so as they age out, we can- And that's... that younger population wants finished houses. They don't want to do the work themselves. Correct. They yeah. want to they want to buy a house yep. and unpack their boxes. So I think that there's also, um, because of where we are, there's a lot lower competition. Again, I know that we are, some people right now are listening going, you, but you guys do everything. Well, we're on TV. We're, we're a big player. No question about it. We're the biggest in the area. But there's still an abundance. There's still enough there to is, go around but for there's anybody less competition. that wants. There's less competition when it comes to, there's no hedge funds. So around right. the country, in a lot of the red states, these giant hedge funds are building. Remember our friend that we just talked to at the last mastermind we're at? What was he buying? 30,000 houses a year? It was insane. We all sat in the room and went, what? <laughs> what? But that's how many they're buying. They're buying tens of thousands of houses. BlackRock is one of those companies that has trillions of dollars here now they're, that's under management. And they're buying, they're buying hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars worth of real estate. And I always say, what do they know that you don't know, right? But they're, they're buying them for long-term rentals in the red states. Right. Landlord-friendly state. But it, which makes sense. But the cool part for us is that they're not... So a lot of our friends compete with them. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they buy houses, then flip them to them. So they, they work with them. In upstate New York and the capital region market, they're not there. And I don't think they're going to be there they're because not interested. they're not interested in buying in a, in a non-landlord -land -land from the state. So if you live there, there's a lot of money to be made without having the competition because right. you think we're a gorilla. Try someone that's buying thousands of homes coming right. in. That's a gorilla, right? We're just a big ape. Right? So I don't know. This is a giant gorilla coming in. So it's, it's, there isn't that much competition up there. Um, 
you know, and all that. So I don't know if there's a lot. And also people do move up to New York City, too. That's sure. something that we learned during COVID. Yeah. People remember, were, remember people people were the coming out of New York City in droves. Yeah. We had the Airbnb across the street from us. And we had somebody that rented the house for six months or something like that because they wanted to get them and their kids out of New York City during COVID. Yeah. I remember and they stayed there for a long time. We had, we had quite a few people come up and rent Airbnb. We had a couple of Airbnbs at the time. The Saratoga Airbnb that we had. Same, yeah. same situation. They wanted to be out of New York City and yeah. they wanted to come up to the, you know, when I was a kid, my parents used to take in what was called fresh air kits. You never heard of that. I, I never thought of that term until just now, but they were called fresh air kids. There are kids that came up from New York City to spend a few weeks in the summer with country folk. Yeah. And they, it just, you know, can you imagine that you grew up in Harlem and then you come up to the country where there's you know, mosquitoes trees and, and trees cows and cows. Around. And you're like, what is this? We had a creek next to our house. And so that people like to get out of the crazy business yeah. of the city and come up to upstate New York. So there's, there's a lot of pluses. Again, it's only two and a half hours to the city, which sounds like a long drive, but you could be at a Yankee game in, in, you know, two and a half hours yeah, from the capital region. We hop on the region. train sometimes to go down to the we city. Did. It wasn't a bad ride. It was, it was fun, fun to go to, didn't yeah. really want to live there, but fun no. to go to. But it makes it makes for us a great place to invest, to flip houses, to wholesale houses, even to buy even the rentals that we have. You know, we struggle with some, we struggle with the laws because of, of tenants, but and taxes, the taxes are in taxes are high. But it, but if you, but rents are also higher. So if you if if you are going to do a few houses and you know build yourself a portfolio of 10 or 20 rentals to retire on, you can 100 percent do it. Just prepare for if you have to evict somebody, it's going to be six months, not 30 days like other states. Yeah. So there's a, there's a cost to pay for it, but it's still, if you live there, it's better than not investing at all. And, and I, I think the point of this podcast is not to tell people, you know, to encourage people to invest in upstate New York. It's to you know, look- stay away. I don't want any more competition <laughs> up there. Yeah. I don't, yeah, yeah I don't, well, yeah, again, st- go. It's, it, yeah. it's, it's so that you can look at your area and see what those sweet spots are and see where your best investment can be Great advice. because you know, your local area, you know, you know, what areas are good, what kind of houses are the best ones to to start making offers on, yeah. you know, what school districts are the best, you know, what's near the, the hospitals and, yeah. you know, you, you know, those, that information. So the point of this podcast and us telling us and doing a deep dive into why upstate New York was good for us, you have equal reasons to look for those yeah. areas in your location. We're as about well. to lock down our first deal in Tampa. I know Meg, our, our rock star director of operations has uh, found a deal in Tampa. I'm that excited they're, about that. We're close to having that thing locked down. So that'd be pretty cool. So when we get that done, that'll be, uh, that'll because be our Because that's first, our new local area. That's our new local area. Right. That's our new, that's our new area. So cool. All right. Well, with that, I guess we are a wrap for this episode. So All right. hope if you, you enjoyed. If you are anywhere near or want to attend the Home Flipping Workshop in person, Amber and I are going to be there in person April 12th through the 14th. That's going to be at the Double Tree on Knot Terrace in Schenectady. And we're going to spend three days diving into everything we do, how to find, fund, fix, flip, hold. If you like our podcast, you like what we're doing, grab a ticket. I think we're only charging $97, crazy cheap, to come hang out with us for three days. Three days. Three days. Three full days. It's a lot of information. We have other speakers going to be there talking to you about tax um, preparation, how to to not pay. Set your business structure up right. Yeah, get your right LLC set there. We have people doing creative financing, a lot of other speakers and it's going to be an awesome, awesome time. Good so, times. so cool. So Hope where you, do they, where do they go to get their ticket? Go to homeflippingworkshop.com. Just go right to homeflippingworkshop.com. And, uh, I think you want to use promo code ready, use promo code ready. And that'll get you the ticket for $97. It's 297 on the site, but anybody wants to grab a ticket. And if you're from the out of the, out of the area, you want to hear us speak, you can stay right at the hotel if you want and, uh, come on in and we'd love to have you. That concludes this episode of the fearless future podcast. If you liked it, make sure you click that like button. And make sure you subscribe and follow us and turn on all those notifications. We'll see you next time.